So it's been a couple years since we did a video about e-bike trends. A lot's changed, so I think it's about time we do another one. That's what we're gonna do today. This video is particularly timely because we're going to Eurobike in a couple of weeks. That's usually where we see a lot of the innovations around electric bikes. But today we're not gonna be talking just about the innovations on technology, but also just like overall what's going on in the industry. What I think we're seeing and what we expect to see over the coming years. And for those of you who don't know, Eurobike is considered probably the biggest consumer bicycle show in the world. It's held in Germany, and although it's considered a bicycle show, a large percentage of the show is electric bikes. But I guess that's a theme overall in the bike industry. Electric bikes are kind of taking over. I've been really thinking on this topic, and there's so much to cover here. Also posted something on Twitter to try to get more input from other people to see what other people are thinking of the trends are. Now, one thing's really clear, if you think about the trends on electric bikes, is that they're growing in popularity. It seems that there's more and more companies getting involved in this space. And the one thing I think about is like, what is this gonna look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Will these companies still be in existence? We've seen a lot of companies come and go, particularly in the US market, but I'm sure worldwide. I'm particularly excited about some of the new entrants that we're seeing and what that might mean for the future of the industry. Porsche, for example. Now they purchased an electric bike company not that long ago called Grape. That company is actually a sister company, I guess you could say, to the same company that produces the powertrain for their cars. They went a little bit further and they actually purchased a motor company called Pozua, a relatively new company, but it's been growing pretty quickly is making these very lightweight integrated motors. So I think that we're gonna see more of that. I think there's probably gonna be more automotive companies entering the market, but then you have companies that I don't know whether or not they actually have business being in this market. Lifestyle brands like putting their name on bikes. I don't know, are they really fit to be doing this thing? How it grows, and if it grows in a positive direction, is really upon all of us to think about. Some areas that it's growing in specifically, and I'm particularly excited about, is cargo bikes. A lot of people are really seeing the utility of them, that it's not just a bicycle, you can do more with it. You can carry kids, you know, more and more families are getting on cargo bikes they're seeing it as a, a fun way to get around they're seeing it also as an economical way to get around as cities start to invest more and more in infrastructure and it becomes safer to ride a bike I think people are finding that to be more of a viable option now we're also seeing cargo bikes grow in popularity in business settings as well companies are using them to transport goods we're seeing pretty much every major logistics provider these days starting to use cargo bikes and I think the overall trend is that in the future of cities, we're gonna see less and less cars. I think cities are tasked with lowering their emissions and making cities safer and more walkable and overall more welcoming to more people. Going further on the types of electric bikes, we're seeing just a wider array of bikes. I think that as the market grows, it actually leaves more room for these more niche products. Historically, we would see very few recumbent bikes, for example. And we're seeing you know, several companies pop up with that. There's a lot of different road bikes, for example, or different types of mountain bikes, or more and more compact bikes, et cetera. So there's really just a wider array where historically you might be lucky if you found one bike in this specific niche, but now you're seeing more and more. We're also seeing a lot of delivery riders. I mean, historically in New York, one of the most popular uses for electric bikes was just for delivery riders. And now I think that people are starting to more widely accept that electric bikes are not just for people delivering goods, it's actually a good way to get around as well, or just a way to enjoy yourself. The technology, in a lot of ways, it's not changing that much. I mean, I think that we're starting to see things level off a little bit. You know, we're still using lithium ion batteries. We're still using the same motors. They're, they're getting slightly more powerful, slightly lighter, slightly smaller form factor. I do think that eventually we're gonna see different battery technologies. I think a lot of people are excited about the potential introduction of these different chemistries for batteries, partly for their potential in improving safety, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then, you know, just the overall ability of materials and making that easier. 
Some other things that we're seeing in the technology side specifically is more and more integration of technology. So basically taking all the technologies that we use on a daily basis, many of which might exist in our cell phone or other sensors that we have on ourselves, like a heart rate monitor, different things like that, and just integrating them together. And I think that's something that we'll continue to see more and more. This idea of the internet of things and everything is connected. Now going further in this idea of how bikes interact with other devices is this big discussion about bikes interacting with cars. This is growing in popularity and this idea that there can be a communication between a bicycle and a car in the future, we'll likely see opportunities for them to be able to communicate with each other, make others aware of different hazards that exist. And one area that I'd like to see more development in, but it's still a little bit lost at the moment, is this like GPS tracking security measure. Now there is technology that exists out there for tracking bikes and that sort of thing, but I think the retrieval side of it gets to be a bit challenging. Now I think different places, they have different rules and laws and systems in place. In North America, it seems to be a little bit challenging. I'm hoping that that develops more and more over time and we're able to address this theft thing because it does seem to be one of these limiting factors in the growth of this technology. That being said, I think that we're seeing more and more infrastructure to support this, like bike parking. I still think that we're pretty far behind compared to many other places, but I'm excited that we're starting to see the introduction of more and more bike parking. New York is making a lot of moves in relation to that. There's a very popular company here called Uni. We're going to see more and more interest and requests for more bike infrastructure, maybe more charging. This is a topic that's really important to me. Now, New York City in this past year, we had nearly 100 fires in relation to electric bikes and electric scooters and different things like that. Now, in a place like New York, we have apartment buildings, you have several families living in there. And if you were to have a fire, it could impact a lot of people, not just your own family, your own safety. So I'm really trying to advocate for stronger testing requirements. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna have to do too much work because I think it's likely gonna happen with or without me. Now, New York City, they actually put a regulation in just this year to require UL. UL is Underwriter Laboratories, and this is kind of a testing standard, if you will. It's a variety of tests that the product needs to go through to ensure that it's safe and to prevent fires. From my side, as an electric bike retailer, I only sell products that meet this standard, but unfortunately, there's a lot of products out there that don't. I'm not aware of many other places in the United States that currently are requiring it, but I do believe that it's coming more and more and likely eventually it will happen on the federal level. And I actually learned as I was investigating this, that a lot of insurance companies are actually not covering shops or buildings, that sort of thing, if they have products in there that are not UL. If you're purchasing a product, I would really recommend you know, looking at that and thinking about that. We're seeing more and more tires that are made for electric bikes, lighting systems or saddles. We're seeing more companies adopt more robust drivetrains. We work quite a bit with the roll-off system. Enviolo is another popular system. We're seeing more and more companies adopt the belt drive system. But speaking on the product side, we should really talk about supply really seeing these unprecedented challenges with supply because there's so many dependencies. If you look at a bicycle, there's probably a thousand little tiny parts from every little screw that goes in there and that sort of thing. If you don't have one of those little parts, you can't build the bicycle. So microchips, everybody's been hearing about that. There's a lot of difficulties there. The electric bike that I ride often has several of them. Just the battery alone has several chips in it. The motor has chips in it, the display, etc. And so all these things add up, there's delays, they're just not able to produce them. This company is just, you know, booked out for the next year or so. Some of that stuff's starting to come around, but the reality is as much as in North America and Europe, we're kind of seem to be turning a corner on COVID. A lot of these other places, they're really not. They're continuing to have shutdowns. And every time that happens, there's kind of this ripple effect. A lot of companies are trying to diversify their supply chain. They're also trying to look and see, are there opportunities to reshore? So actually produce things in America or wherever your native location is. I'm excited about the possibilities of producing things in America. That would be really cool. 
places like Europe where they kind of retained a lot of that production, they're able to, you know, scale a lot of that stuff back up. So could that happen here? Sure. I think it will take longer, but uh, still optimistic. One of the important factors to consider there is really the cost of shipping and the, and the time it takes to ship things. Now, historically, you might be able to ship a container for a couple thousand dollars, and now you can ship a container for upwards of $20,000. There's times where it's going upwards of 10 times the original price to ship a container. Now, this might work with certain products, but it can be very difficult with some bulkier products. And maybe if you're trying to keep costs down, that could be a challenging thing. Speaking of costs, I think that there's a big factor as well. I mean, the costs definitely seem to be rising in a lot of sectors. I mean, I think there's push to offer lower priced options but as the market really spreads out there's the premium market is getting bigger the lower end market's getting bigger although i think some of the real low end stuff is going to start falling away especially as we start to see some of the safety regulations increase but speaking more on the price topic we're seeing more and more rebates coming online you know there's different power companies different organizations getting involved trying to push through on the federal level in america i know that we've seen a lot of that stuff in europe and we've seen it really help the success of electric bikes. Electric bikes really need to make sense without rebates, but I can understand that idea of getting that critical mass and really building up that initial growth to help be a catalyst to get more people on it. Because if it's easier for them to get into it, it's more likely that they will actually, you know, cross that divide, if you will. That being said, I think that there's a lot of places where the concentration of electric bikes has grown pretty significantly and it's just becoming a normal thing. And as long as we can remove some of these barriers, it, it'll really work. From what I understand to be one of the biggest catalysts in Europe specifically is electric bike leasing. There's a leasing program, the employer gets involved, the government helps out a little bit, maybe your insurance rates go down a little bit, and you couple all those things together and you're paying a very small monthly fee to have access to a really nice electric bike. I think that this is one of the big opportunities in the market and really hope that we see this in the future. Sustainability is another really important factor. I think more and more companies, as they're looking at their supply chain, just on the logistics side, they're also looking at it on the sustainability side. How are things working on a global scale? My trade partners, what are they doing? Are they being responsible with the environment? Is this a responsible decision to have these products shipped in this type of way? Or different things like that, the materials that we're using, where are they sourced, what's the labor involved with producing these things. Some companies moving in this direction of becoming carbon neutral, this is happening in many different industries. We're really proud to be able to work with Bosch where they're actually carbon neutral and that's a really big deal and not an easy feat. Another one of our partners, Risa Mueller, they actually put out this sustainability guide and they're really giving a lot of details into the direction that they're going. And I can really appreciate when companies are kind of thinking beyond what is required or asked of you and saying like, you know, but this is the right thing to do. This is the way to do it more proactively. That's the direction that I'm trying to go. And I know a lot of people are motivated for different reasons to go with other things and do different things. but. I think that this is important, like let's think about like how can we do this in a sustainable way, in a way that's going to work long term and I really encourage others to think in that way as well. Another big topic in relation to sustainability is battery recycling. A lot of people would often talk about, well, what happens to the battery afterwards and a lot of people try to poke holes in the viability and really the environmental impacts of using the electric bike. But now there's actually a program that we're now participating in. It's called Coal to Recycle. And it's a program where actually over 90% of the battery materials can be recycled. So some other challenging things going on, we're starting to see some bans. With the electric bikes, some people are not really behaving in the best way or you know really respecting their environment and the people around them. We talked about batteries, which are really starting to cause some bans. And I think that's largely because of this, you know, minimal testing requirements. I think if there was some level of confidence that the products that are being transported are tested and they're safe, then they're probably less concerned about that. But given that that's not the standard right now, it's kind of scary. I mean, from my side, I think that that could happen very quickly. More and more buildings can say that. And I would hope that they would say, well, nothing that doesn't meet this 
fire code uh, of UL testing, but there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. And, and, and you know, who's going to discern what the difference is? And, and I'm really trying to encourage people to think differently about this stuff and try to be more proactive as an industry because this could very easily uh, go away or just really limit the ability to use these things in a meaningful way. I mean, not to mention we're starting to see some trails say like no electric bikes, people are being reckless, people are getting hurt. I don't want to be a downer, but I just, these are some of the things that we're starting to see. I really believe that we have a gift here. I really believe that this product has the potential to solve so many challenges. And there's a lot of forces fighting against this and it's really our job to present it and use it in a responsible manner. I'm excited to see more and more electric bike share. This is really cool. New York City, they just introduced a new electric bike and it's pretty nice. I like the idea of electric bike share to get more people out on bikes. Talk about like low barrier to entry, just like they're available all over the place. You could just get one for a minimal amount of money and, and use it and enjoy it. And, and you don't have to worry about security and different things like that. Mergers and acquisitions seem to be a big topic. One of the bigger companies that we work with, Pond, they own a couple of brands that we work with, namely Gazelle and Urban Arrow. They've been purchasing other brands. They actually recently became the largest bike manufacturer in the world. And one of their more notable purchases recently was a cycling sports group, which included uh, Cannondale, GT, Schwinn. Companies are also starting to purchase more bike shops so they can kind of control their distribution. This idea of vertical integration, you're the bike manufacturer and you're the distributor and you're the retailer, so you can control all aspects of the supply chain. The way that they distribute products is changing more and more as well, where companies are starting to have this omni-channel approach where they're selling in the retail shop, they're also selling online. And, and I think COVID has made people more and more comfortable with that. I mean, we've been selling online since the early days in 2011 when I started. The direct-to-consumer thing is really grown and, and, and really gotten a lot of attention. Probably one of the most notable companies in that space is Rad Power Bikes. I mean, they raised like $300 million in investment and they just have overall a bit of a different approach. Our products are a little bit different. It's a different strategy, focus and idea and concept and, and the way that they're produced and, and things like that. But I respect it and I respect the scale that they've grown to. And overall, there seems to be a lot of the other direct-to-consumer type models that are growing in popularity as well. And it definitely seems to be a big thing with customers. They appreciate having that like lower price option. And it seems like these companies are growing up pretty quickly. I can appreciate where they're coming from and I wish I had you know lower price options to make products more accessible to more people. And I think that will happen in time as the market scales, there'll be more opportunity there. Kind of trying to take the long term approach and, and there might be an opportunity to make more money in the shorter term selling cheaper products. But speaking on the investment thing, as I mentioned, Rad Power got like over $300 million. Dan Muth got like over $100 million in investment. Another company, Cowboy Electric Bikes, who's big in Europe, they got over $100 million. So it's a lot of excitement in these new brands. And from my side, like, is this like the new like bubble, if you will? Is this really sustainable? Is it gonna work long term? I don't really know. There's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot that I've kind of like dreamed about years ago that was kind of coming true now. So we also got some tweets. I'm gonna read a couple of them. I almost like forgot about, but it's just like reading through these tweets. It's like, yeah, people becoming more accepting of their existence. People realizing the e-bike's usefulness in regards to surgery, illness, recovery. I think the bottom line is actually it's useful in just way beyond that. This is a challenge for the general public not being able to distinguish the different e-bike types. For example, e-moped or like modified electric bikes that might go really fast and different things like that. This can hurt the appeal of e-bikes, especially in local policy. Thinking long term, thinking like how, how are these things going to impact us? And I think this is actually a big thing that's likely going to happen where these like what would be considered out of class electric bikes, things that are not a motorcycle, but they're not an electric bike and they kind of don't really fit in these things. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is the one that actually regulates these type of things. They would likely uh, start to instill some like fines for companies selling them and stuff like that. Cycle Six Miles says more people using inexpensive e-bikes for transportation. 
This is in Detroit where 25% of people don't have access to a car. It makes me think e-bike subsidies would go a long way towards mode shift in the Motor City. And we see that a lot, like people coming into a shop, they started with a really inexpensive e-bike and they're like, you know, I want something a little bit better, a little bit more reliable, safer battery, different things like that. And they kind of come around with that. So totally get that. And I could see, yeah, rebates could really help. Stephen J says, suddenly seeing a lot of families would one parrot piloting. So in other words, seeing cargo e-bikes suddenly proliferate for family use. Very cool, very fun. That's what we're seeing as well. I mean, especially in New York, uh, from our shop, that's one of the more popular types of bikes that people are getting into. Because the reality is because there's lack of bike parking and different things like that, you really have to realize a lot of the utility for these type of things to make sense. So, but on that note, I think that that's mostly all I wanted to cover here. I think I'm gonna, go ride on back. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's a little bit tricky filming this one because so many ideas, like really, there's so much going on, so many changes, and things are pretty unpredictable, but nonetheless, it's exciting what's going on, exciting the changes, and, and I'm really excited to see what comes next. As I said in the beginning of the video, we're gonna be going to Eurobike, so let us know if there's anything that you wanna see. Are there some trends that, that you're seeing that you're excited about? I think that's about it. So we'll see you soon and uh, thanks for watching.